Welcome to Club Book with Leila Lalami. My name is Rodrigo Sanchez Chavarria. I am a writer, spoken word poet, um, heavily involved with the collective called Palavistas, a based, uh, Minnesota based uh, Latinx Poets Collective. But I've also am a, um, one of the co authors in the um, um, collection of essays, uh, A Good Time for the Truth, uh, Race in Minnesota. And um, before I introduce Layla properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing, bringing uh, Layla to us. Uh, Club Book is a program of MELSA, uh, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota Arts and Culture Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Stra Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Club Book has been part of the Twin Cities literally landscapes in some form for about a decade or more, but they've never brought you a season quite like this. Thanks for making the pivot with us to uh, Facebook Live. Thanks also to the partnering booksellers, uh, Red Balloon Bookshop, uh, a purchase link to the Conditional Citizens, which I cannot hi recommend highly enough. Um, it's a really great pickup book specifically for the times that we are currently living in. Uh, it will be available in the comments section of this live feed stream. Have it shipped, picked it up at their lovely store in St. Paul on Grand Avenue or have them deliver it to, personally to your door if you're in the area. Um, one um, final housekeeping note. Also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melissa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program, particularly in light of the necessary changes in format for this fall. It's quick and easy. And uh, if I may also say it's also essential. So if you uh, enjoy of anything, this conversation of this program, um, I would encourage you to sur uh, submit the uh, survey as well. Um, without further ado, um, you, I'm gonna introduce Leila, Leila Lalami, is a novelist, essayist, critic, and professor. She was born in uh, Rabat and educated in Morocco, Great Britain, and the United States. Alami is the author of four books of fiction, including The Moors Account, which reconstructs the journeys of the New World's first Black explorer, an enslaved man from Morocco who arrived in Florida with Spanish conquistadors in 1528. The novel won the American Book Award and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Alami's follow-up, The Other Americans, centers around the mysterious death of a Moroccan immigrant in California. Equal parts family drama, murder mystery, and love story. The Other Americans was a national bestseller and a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award in Fiction. Alami's newest release, Conditional Citizens, hit shelves just two weeks ago and is something of a departure. In this deeply personal expose, the author uses her own unlikely immigration story as a starting point for exploring the question, what does it mean to be American? One reviewer noted, probing and unflinching and fiercely intelligent, Conditional Citizens is a must read for all those who have started, have stared, stunned, at the shifting terrain of our political landscape and wonder how we got here. After a short presentation and reading by our guests, we'll have a time for audience Q&A. Simply, uh, we ask that you drop your questions in the comments, threads here or on Facebook, and our tech manager will route them to me. As a point of departure, I'm eager to ask, Leila, how did this project come to be? Hi, thanks so much for that introduction, Rodrigo. And thanks so much to all of you who are tuning in tonight from Minneapolis and beyond. Um, so the book Conditional Citizens for me began four years ago. Uh, like many of you, I, I imagine, um, I spent the uh, week, the final week of August 2016 watching the Democratic National Convention um, and all of the speeches every night. And I remember there was a, a speech, I think on the next to last night, the penultimate night by a gentleman. Um, at the time I didn't know his name, but now we know it was Q 
Kizar Khan, uh, who came with his wife, Ghazala Khan, and he came to speak uh, in support of um, the Democratic nominee, um, who had in fact voted for the war in which his son had died. His son was a captain in the United States Army who died uh, on the battlefield. And, um, or who died essentially outside his, his, um, his base, but he died protecting his, his uh, fellow officers, fellow soldiers. And, but the Khans considered the opposing candidate to be so dangerous that they had come to speak on behalf of Hillary Clinton. And there was this electrifying moment when he pulled out his copy, his pocket copy of the constitution. And it was, it was really a, a very moving moment where he asked, do you, have you even read the constitution? And then in the weeks that followed that moment, uh, associates of Trump, including Roger Stone, started circulating all these rumors about this man, saying, for example, that he was a stooge for the Muslim Brotherhood, or that his wife had stood by silently because she was forbidden to speak. And they even had rumors that the son who had died in Iraq, who had given up his life for his country, that he was in fact a stealth jihadist. It was, in other words, very ugly episode. And watching it all unfold, um, I was honestly filled with rage because it made me feel that even when you give up your life for your country, your allegiance can still be called into question. People will still say that you didn't die for your country, but that you might have died as a traitor. And that was very um, uh, enraging. So I wrote a column about this. I write uh, columns for The Nation magazine. I wrote a column about this called Conditional Citizens. And um, at the time I was working on my novel, The Other Americans, I was still finishing that manuscript. And so when I finished it in 2018 and turned it in, I decided to then go back and focus on this idea of conditional citizenship and to expand um, this idea that your citizenship can be called into questions at moments like this, expand that idea into a book which became Conditional Citizens. Um, and as I began to work on it, it's a collection of, of essays on the same theme of citizenship. I realized in short order that almost anything that I could say about uh, the uh, treatment of Muslims in America, I could also say about the treatment of other groups that had um, uh, arrived here before them, or that had um, this sort of vexed relationship with uh, their government. So for example, if I was talking about this idea of allegiance, this idea that you might be perceived as being less than faithful to your country, that is an idea that back in 1942 led to the internment of Japanese Americans throughout um, uh, the, the, the West Coast. And in fact, the place in which I was sworn in as a citizen, the Pomona Fairplex, served as an assembly center in 1942 for Japanese Americans in Southern California. And that's where they were assembled and then put on trains and shipped off to internment camps in Wyoming. Um, if I look at the idea of assimilation, so for example, Trump has said that he doesn't believe that Muslims have assimilated to American culture. That is also another idea that has um, very, that has been deployed to sort of call into question whether people who have come here belong here or not. So it was deployed against Italians and so on and so, and, and other groups before them. And it was also it was such a powerful idea that historically it was even used in very violent ways against indigenous Americans through the forced assimilation programs and the taking away of their children and putting them in Indian boarding schools. Um, if I look at, at um, 
ideas like surveillance, so Muslims are one of the most highly surveilled communities in the United States, then I would have to actually also look at the surveillance of African Americans, particularly civil rights leaders and, and, um, and, and just intellectuals and so on and so forth. So once I started to draw those connections, I realized that the architecture of the book had to reflect that and had to talk about each of these uh, aspects of citizenship. Um, and that is how conditional citizens came about. Um, and perhaps I might read a short excerpt for you. Oh, if you, if you would give us the honor to do that, that would be great. Okay, so this is the opening of the book. I just thought it might give you an idea of sort of the tone and the style of the book. This is a story about love and country, and I will tell it to you how I remember it, in strands that took me years to untangle and then thread together. I became an American on a sweltering day in 2000, a day when the marine layer over Los Angeles cleared off before breakfast. The exact date had been circled on my wall calendar with the same blue Sharpie I used to mark holidays, and I thought of it as an equally festive occasion, the culmination of a journey that had begun when I came to the United States as a foreign student eight years earlier. Over the course of those years, I had adopted, almost without realizing it, two of the more emblematic trappings of that particular era. I worked for a technology startup company and drove an SUV for which I had no discernible need. The deregulation of banks, the war in the Balkans, and Bill Clinton's angry denials that he did not have sex with that woman were in the past. The NASDAQ was at a record high. Unemployment was at a record low. The future seemed full of possibility. The citizenship ceremony was held at the Pomona Fairplex, a 487-acre facility best known for hosting the Los Angeles County Fair every summer. I remember wearing a sleeveless dress, a silver necklace my mother had given me, and a pair of new shoes that blistered my feet. My husband was in the same black suit and tie he had worn at our wedding. Ushers directed us to building four, a large gray hall where I turned in my alien registration card and was handed a miniature flag in return. Folding chairs had been set up in two columns. Those who were to be sworn in had to sit on the left side of the aisle, their guests on the right. At precisely 9 a.m., the first few notes of the Star Spangled Banner played on the loudspeaker and a hush fell over the audience. The air smelled of fresh roses and heavy cologne, but the mix could not fully disguise the scent of 3,000 people gathered in a windowless hall in 98 degree weather. The presiding judge, an elderly man in wire rimmed glasses, came to the lectern and delivered a homily about the rights and responsibilities that awaited us. Citizenship was a privilege we had earned, he said, and we were to honor it by participating in civic life voting in elections, serving on juries, even running for office. He had kindly eyes and a warm demeanor. It seemed impossible that he would ever pass a cruel or unfair sentence on anyone in his courtroom. After his speech, he moved to the center of the stage and asked us to stand so that we could recite the Oath of Allegiance. I raised my right hand. Love had brought me to that moment. When I came to the United States, my intention had been to complete a doctoral degree in linguistics and return home to Morocco, where I hoped to work as a college professor. But one day I met a man who made me reconsider many things, not least of which my distrust of romance. Alex and I had nothing in common. He was a network engineer, listened to grunge music, liked to spend entire weekends hiking up one mountain or another in Southern California. My hobbies were limited to reading. Still, whenever we were together, we lost track of time. I remember us driving to a movie in Century City one night and missing the freeway exit twice because we were so engrossed in our conversation. After it became clear that our relationship was serious, we realized that one of us had to live in the other's country. I was young and in love. I made a commitment to my husband and another to his homeland. 
I applied for permanent residency, a process that required submitting to a background check, sending in tax returns, going on interviews, and jumping through various bureaucratic hoops. One day, a notice arrived from the Department of Justice informing me that I was eligible for naturalization. I spent weeks studying for the citizenship exam. Alex helped by quizzing me while we were eating dinner or washing dishes. How many voting members are there in the House of Representatives? 435. Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Jefferson. What stops a branch of government from being too powerful? Checks and balances. But in the end, I didn't find the test particularly challenging. Perhaps it was before, long, because long before setting foot in the United States, I had taken courses on its history, studied its literature, and become fluent in its culture. The familiarity I realized within days of arriving in California was not mutual. Then the moment came when I had to take the oath. I swore to renounce allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince of whom I had been a subject, to support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States, and to bear true faith to the same. Faith was an apt word for the leap I was taking. I was placing my trust in America. Alex and I came out of Building 4, holding hands and squinting in the sunlight. Later that morning, he dropped me off at my office, and an hour later, I was called to a meeting. I opened the door to the conference room to find my colleagues, lexicographers and programmers and business analysts, huddled together under red, white, and blue balloons. Surprise! they hollered in unison. On the table was a catered lunch of hamburgers, apple pie, and lemonade. As I said, a festive occasion. Nearly 20 years have passed since that summer morning at the Pomona Fairplex. I am no longer a starry-eyed bride, but maturity has its advantages. I can see better now what I had perceived only dimly back then. Being a citizen of the United States, I had thought, meant being an equal member of the American family, a spirited group of people of different races, origins, and creeds bound together by common ideals. As time went by, however, the contradictions between doctrine and reality became harder to ignore. While my life in this country is in most ways happy and fulfilling, it has never been entirely secure or comfortable. Certain facts regularly stand in the way, facts that make of me a conditional citizen. By this, I mean that my relationship to the state observed through exposure to its policies or encounters with its representatives is affected in all sorts of ways by my being an immigrant, a woman, an Arab, and a Muslim. Shortly after taking the oath, I applied for and received an American passport. The blue booklet was at once a tangible proof of my new citizenship and a powerful artifact that gave me the freedom to travel without restriction to more than 150 countries. I made use of it when I flew to Hong Kong in October 2000 to attend the annual meeting of the Association for Computational Linguistics. Alex had decided to tag along and we spent a few days sightseeing on the island and in the Kowloon Peninsula. Coming back to the US, we went through customs at Los Angeles International Airport, both of us relieved not to have to go in separate lines anymore. When we walked up to the counter, the border agent examined both of our passports, then turned to my husband. So, he said, his face breaking into a conspiratorial smile, how many camels did you have to trade in for her? And I will stop there. Well, thank you very much for that, um, that, that uh, brief introduction to, to your book. Um, as some of you may see, like I love writing um, notes <laughs> into the borders of pages. And, and, and this book for me was, was full of a lot. And one of the first things um, was um, I, I tried to understand um, what you what your definition was of conditional citizenship. And I think that was a really interesting um, idea and a different way of putting in it. Um, my own upbringing, um, you know, my family came here in 1988, um, um, leaving Peru during uh, political turmoil. Um, I, we were fortunate to be able to, um, my parents to be, you know, similar to, to, to in your case, my parents were, were graduate students at the, at the university, which meant that, uh, you know, it, 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 um, that I was, 
you know, uh, if people get into that conversation of F1 and F2, I was an F2 in a sense, right? I was, I was a dependent of an F1. And um, as my journey took me through many different facets of um, living in, in, in Minnesota, I, um, I identify with a lot of, of, of your similar experiences that we had. I remember being sworn in at, um, for, um, for my citizenship. Um, and I remember being in the same gym that my now then six-year-old daughter had taken ballet classes. Um, and at the same time, I remember when I was able to, you know, get my um, permitted residency, which uh, people still refer to it as a green card, which is no longer a green card. I think it's, it's pink in the sense of color. Um, I remember um, one of the things that they always told me is to to never go anywhere without it. And there's a moment in exchange when I, we're doing our citizenship where they collect that information for you. They collect the 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 so-called green card. And I was very hesitant to give it to 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 the person in line because it was you know for a long time of time that was my that was my condition of, of, of being in this country and 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 so it you know it took me literally it registered it took me maybe six six seven seconds to register the fact that I didn't I didn't perhaps need this anymore but um, it, it just really speaks to the experience of, of, of what it's like to be able to be um, talked, uh, be given the, the, the right to citizenship, but also understanding what, what, uh, what comes with it uh, and how it is and how you're able to get there. Um, I personally, you know, like, I, I enjoyed a lot of, 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 the, of the book. I, I wanted to see if perhaps you were, you could indulge us. Um, I started writing down um, a lot of instances and you describe it and in the books full of them in which, you know, you face adversity in some sort of sense and, 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 and in a better, in a better use of words, you, you, you face a lot of uh, racial microaggressions um, and, um, and living through them is one thing, but if we live in and through them as a writer and having to write about them, uh, for me, at least, it takes it takes a lot of emotional labor um, having to resurface some of that stuff. Um, how how did you manage to, or how did you decide what to include in those aspects of of, of those uh, into your book specifically? I mean, I I agree. It's never easy to bring up things that are. Um, unpleasant and sometimes extremely traumatic. There are other parts of the book that, that in fact are really quite traumatic and having to revisit them, it was uh, difficult during the writing of this book. So I would write something and then I would have to take a break and like, you know, not write for a couple of days just because it was hard. At the same time, I set out to write a book that would explore my relationship with the US. Uh, citizenship is something that that you don't really think about until there are certain um, specific situations that raise the idea of citizenship. And as a status, it is something that is entirely arbitrary. None of us choose the country in which we are born uh, or any, anything else about our birth, the, the social class into which we're born, the, city, the, the country, the gender, the race, none of us choose any of that. And yet those arbitrary markers of identity end up um, controlling a lot of the rights uh, that we have and that we enjoy throughout life. So for example, if you are born in, say for example, um, North Korea, um, you're not going to have freedom of movement. You're not going to be able to leave the country um, on tourism. You know, it's just going to be very difficult to do something like that. Uh, or if you're born in the Gaza Strip, no freedom of movement either. You can't, you pretty much can't leave. So there are, there are certain um, rights that you can't access because completely because of arbitrary um, things about, about your, your birth. 
naturalized citizenship is unusual in the sense that it is a choice, right? So we decide that we are going to embrace this country. And I set about writing a book that would look at this choice that I made 20 years ago and sort of really explore what it meant to me at the time versus what it means to me now. And uh, in order to be able to do that, it, it did require revisiting moments that were uh, that ranged from what's described as microaggressions, which I would file this one that I just read about where the border agent thinks that he is entitled to make jokes like that. Right, correct. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of like sexual jokes because it, it basically implies that something was traded, you know, as if right. I'm a sexual object to be traded. Uh, and that actually has happened more than once. And it was the same joke. It's, and it's almost like they're reading from the same <laughs> book of jokes. So, so that would be like, I would characterize that as a microaggression, but then it can go all the way to a more traumatic experience and a more physically threatening experience. And I certainly have had that also at airports. So um, because that was what was required of me in order to write this book, uh, and because I wanted to use a combination of personal experience, but also sort of, uh, you know, research and analysis. And I can't just put all of the analysis without sort of the personal experience. And so the book threads both of those things. And I decided that if I was going to do it, it did have to include those moments. Now, I tend to be an intensely private person, even though, you know, I'm on social media, but mostly it is to share bit, bits and pieces about culture and writing, but it's not a place where I share much about my personal life. So it was one of the more difficult uh, parts of writing this book was choosing to include all of this stuff that I don't necessarily talk about with, with different people. In fact, some of my friends read this book and were surprised by some of the personal um, anecdotes. And I, I'm not writing them and including them because I'm seeking pity. I'm writing them and including them because I'm seeking to find an understanding of what citizenship means to all of us uh, and means to me. Um, and so in order to, to sort of build that real critique of citizenship, it was necessary to include them. No, and I, I, I agree. I think um, the inclusion of your, um, of your mother-in-law and, and, and like something that always um, comes in, in, in my mind that stuck out in my mind was when she said, you know, salimos sin nada, right? We, we, le we left without anything, right? And so like, I can totally see my auntie, I can totally see that, that kind of uh, female voice coming strong specifically mm -hmm. through this. And that's one of the things that you do beautifully throughout this whole, this whole book, in, in my opinion, is, is you are able to engage the reader with your personal narrative, your personal story, and yet um, do analytical, you do analytical research and you include historical facts to back up your, your, your because so then like, you know, like in situ in, in specifically when we're talking to the effects of, uh, you know, after what happened in 9-11 and, 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 and all the, all the, all the work that the Muslim community was doing with the Bush administration prior to that, um, you know, there's, there's stuff that people may not be aware of and, um, specifically living in Minnesota where, where um, we have a, a growing Muslim community and a, a vibrant Muslim community in, in different parts, not only in the Twin Cities, but also outside and in, in different areas. It's, I find it very, very, very um, refreshing to be able to, to, to look at that and, 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 and personally also identify with some of that as, a, as an immigrant myself too. Um, Earlier in, I believe, the first chapter in, in Allegiance, you, you talk about, and this is uh, a question that was submitted, um, you describe your decision to become an American citizen, citizen as a leap of faith. Um, why, why do you feel that way? What, what, what came to using that kind of terminology? Um, well, I think it is, I think of it as part of the reason that this chapter has all of that detail about my mother-in-law is that in some sense whom by the way i adored my mother-in-law <laughs> and uh and it is 
if she was like a second mother to me. And so I think, and you know, in the chapter, there's basically this sort of gently building parallel between the, the sort of second mother and like this second country. And I think that in choosing to have this additional family does require a leap of faith because any, any um, relationship involves trust and trust means you're taking a leap of faith. You're going to say, I'm going to trust this person. And so um, that is why I, I, I use that. And I think also because over the next 20 years, I'm going to discover a lot of things about, about citizenship in the United States and all the ways in which it's deeply unequal, not just in the past, but in the present, that a system that was from its inception was built uh, on equality and has reproduced that equality over centuries and then more recently over decades. Um, and so I think that understanding that relationship between citizenship and, and sort of this hierarchical um, setup is why I think that it's apt to talk about it as faith because you can, you can trust something and still be able to see um, all the ways in which it wasn't what you thought it was. Um, and so I think that um, in that chapter, it's absolutely the right word. And then later on in the book, I go into sort of the history of citizenship. So citizenship in the United States at least at its founding was something that was limited to free white persons. Now, of course, at the time, this country had, <laughs> this country had people who were not free and it had people who were not white. And those people did not have access to citizenship and they were therefore to be governed entirely by force. And um, because of the fact that citizenship was already as a, uh, status started out unequal with reserved to a small group of people that inequality ended up being reproduced over many generations and while certain groups have had access to citizenship thanks to a long and bloody struggle that included a civil war um, a suffragette movement a civil rights movement um, Thanks to that struggle, we've had the citizenship has been expanded to more and more people, um, not just indigenous people or black people or, or uh, white women and black women and all of that, but also to people of Asian descent who did not have access to citizenship either for the most, for the almost entire, for the bigger part of the history of the United States. So it's really only recently that citizenship has been sort of disconnected from race starting in 1965. But because of that history, there's still a lot of that inequality is still being reproduced uh, because of right. the way the system was, was, was built. Right, the way the system was built and how yeah. over generations it just became an innate um, understanding or expectation in a sense. I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, of that. And... Um, and you and you talk about those historical uh, uh, moments in, in in the book, which I think are extremely well tied into to the essays as as well too. And I I think too is like specifically when 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 we talk about um, you know citizenship or when we talk about uh, the aspect of uh, equality, we also have to have a conversation about power in a sense. And I think that's. And, and that's kind of what you we've been sort of been sort of having as the aspect of it. You 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 pointed it very well that you know just be, because of the way citizenship was defined earlier, uh, when it was extended out, um, the paper might have say equal, but the power dynamic did not. Right, and you can see this in many different ways. Which is, for example, since this is taking place in Minnesota, uh, Ilhan Omar who represents, I believe, the fifth district of Minnesota, has been told more than once by the president of this country to go back. Uh, has been told that she 
um, uh, that she that she's trying to run this country like the country that she came from. I mean, all kinds of things. And that idea that one person can tell another person to to go somewhere else, that power, that that um, sense that you get to say who belongs and who doesn't derives from that historical connection between race and citizenship. The person who's saying go back namely the president, is somebody who wrote a book in which he berated America. The book was called Crippled America. And he spent his entire 2016 campaign berating the country and saying how everything in it was terrible, but was not told to go back by, <laughs> by people like Ilhan Komar. Because again, there's not that connection of like saying, you know, that, that you feel that you're more entitled to have that, that status of citizenship or unconditional citizenship. Yeah, no, and, I, and thank you for bringing that up because that's that's exactly what, um, you know, that that I that, that I also having conversations with other folks, specifically um, folks who are now um, becoming uh, more aware of the situation and, and of that we that, that this country is in, um, but a situation that that has made strides in the axis of equality and equity in a sense, but it hasn't f fully embraced uh, that idea that, that I guess there's that, like you said, the leap of faith, there's that lack of trust. Like when you, when you trust someone and specifically it's personal, trust is personal. It's like, it has to be between one, one individual and another. And for that to happen, you, you need to have a, an ongoing relationship uh, and that you both know each other very well. And that's why I think like having a, a trust with citizenship in this country is like I at one point as I can say I did not know this country very well <laughs> and I don't think it, it knew me very well either so 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 I, I found that that was the, the very intriguing in the aspect of it I, I I really gravitated if I may just switch our conversation to um, the there's there's um, in I believe the second chapter um, there's a there's a, which is a, which is faith uh, where um where there's a are you believe you're the scenario is you're you're doing a presentation or you're doing a book tour or you're talking about a book and there is this uh, this lady this woman in the blue pants suit um, who asks a question um, um, and like the first thing that I associated with that was was the aspect of of, of the now well-known uh, archetype of, of Karen, right? Like the, the person who, who, who wants to be able to know the questions to instigate and, 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 and do that. And, and I've, I've personally been in a similar situation specifically when, you've, when we've talked about uh, here in Minnesota where we've, I've gone to different places outside of the Twin Cities, which is where I live. And I grew up in Lima, Peru. I'm a city kid. Like being out in the suburbs, sometimes it's just, it's, just messes with my head and I have to go with a certain different type of attitude when I leave the city. Uh, but um, so there's that idea of safety, right? Like my safety for me is, is being within the city aspect. Not, not saying that I'm not, not going to run into uh, issues uh, that revolve uh, nativist uh, theories or, or people who want to do that, but at least I feel I'm more prepared to engage them if I choose to in, in that area, but outside of that, it's, it's where I don't feel that. I, and I remember having a conversation with someone who uh, wanted us to define what Minnesota racism was like. And I was like, it just, it, the people in the panel that we were in were like, well, what, how do we want to do that? And so how, how does a, uh, a character or a person like, like, like the women in the blue pet suit and uh, the question is like, that they, that they ask, how do, how does that, how do you use that as, 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 as I guess, a, a tool to, to, to formulate more of, 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 of throughout, throughout, throughout the, uh, to prove, or not to prove, but to talk more about some of these issues that, that you so well point in, in the book? So I, I think that event took place in Arizona and the, oh, lady, the woman, yeah. well, no, I mean, the woman in the blue pantsuit had a, a question for me, and that question, um, I was there to give a talk about a historical novel called The Moore's Account, 
which is this book. It's a, um, it's a historical novel based on the true story of an enslaved man from Morocco who's brought to uh, Florida with a Spanish expedition in 1528. Uh, and so the book is told from his perspective. So, you know, I'm standing at the lectern and talking about this incredible adventure of um, conquistadors and encounters with indigenous people and this enslaved man who's kind of an interloper. He's neither conqueror nor conquered. So it is very much like a 16th century tale. And then when we open it up for questions, um, this lady raised her hand and wanted to know more about me and my upbringing in Morocco. And then the next thing I know, she's asking me about ISIS. And I was just um, struck by the fact that we went from talking about history in the 16th century to suddenly talking about a transnational terrorist group who's at the time was based in uh, a town in Syria. And I was just trying to figure out the leap uh, from one subject to the other. And the only connection was the fact that I was standing in front of her and I was an author and, you know, and a Muslim author, so she wanted to ask questions. Now, in general, I welcome all questions and I, I am happy to answer them, but I do have to question how a person can go from one topic to the other. And to me, that suggests that there is a failure of, um, understanding about a group like that, even though it was in the news every day in 2015. It wasn't really something that that was obscure. I mean, this is a group um, that uh, played a part in how policy was shaped. So, so it's not, and it was covered extensively in the pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times. I mean, American newspapers were covering this group. It was it was also on television news, it was on radio. I mean, it wasn't difficult to get information. So why would you ask an author who's writing about a historical novel about that? And so to me, it suggested that there's also a certain kind of confusion, despite the coverage, or maybe even because of it, about this group, and she saw an opportunity to ask me. And I kind of deconstruct that in the book and talk about how that kind of ignorance about Muslims stems, has a long history and really comes from the fact that people in this country don't know that Muslims were here before there was a colony at Jamestown, including the, the as I said, the character in this book. The Karen archetype and the permit patties and all of that, that was around at the time that I think that, I mean, I, from what I remember, that was something that people were starting to talk about, which is a little bit different to me. Like that is more of a policing of public space where public space, which theoretically belongs to all of us. So it's in the public domain. We each theoretically have the same right to move about, to appear in public, to walk down the street. These are all like, this is part of freedom of movement, which is of course guaranteed by, um, by our Bill of Rights, you know, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. And yet, you know, you hear about these cases and there were plenty of them during the writing of this book. And I actually talk about them um, in the chapter on race. Uh, where a woman would call the cops because people were barbecuing uh, near Lake Merritt or because somebody was entering or leaving an Airbnb or like there was a range of, of things that people were just doing, minding their own business, and then suddenly the cops are getting called on them. So basically, this suggests, or we, again, we go back to that whole connection between race and citizenship, where there is the perception that because one is white, which means that has a closer, that citizenship was built for people that were of that race, that people like that have the expectation that they can rely on um, uh, the police to enforce the boundaries of public space as, as they see them. Uh, so in other words, it's basically challenging the 
the ability of black folks, indigenous folks, people of color of just basically be in public space unimpeded and undisturbed. Uh, and that is, um, again, it has to do with this, how we relate to citizenship and how we perceive it and what role it plays in our lives. Thank you for that. Um, there's, um, I, when I have conversations with people, um, sometimes regarding aspect of, of race or of my upbringing, the, the question of um, ally, allyship or how can an ally help uh, comes, comes up every once in a while. And I really like the, um, um, a section in faith when you pretty much, at least to me, was, was, was a call to action in the accident of the, uh, you know, you talk about coexistence should not be a passive state having a sticker on one's car or sign in one's yard is a beautiful gesture and even, necess even a necessary one at times of division and hatred, but it's not enough. And I, and I think um, I wanted to thank you for, for saying that thing because sometimes I have conversations with people who love to wear buttons, <laughs> but are not willing to, you know, to, to create that, that, that button into an action. And I think that's one of the things that, at least personally for me, is, is, is something that I that I feel needs to happen more in, mm -hmm. in this in in this country that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, let me. Um, I want to ask a question of another, um, um, and I'm trying to find the page right now. But there was an instance in where you, you start the the chapter, and when talking about, uh, you're talking to someone on, a, on an airplane ride and they talk about, I think it thinks the assimilation chapter, is it the- uh, Oh yes. Uh, the problem is that they don't assimilate. Oh yes. And yeah. I think um, personally, I've, I've heard that so many times and I, and I, and I, and I really enjoyed um, how you were able to kind of address that, that statement. Um, it, it, could, you, could you just perhaps elaborate a little bit more yeah, on, yeah. on that situation? Yeah, uh, so this was, if I remember correctly, this was in 2000 and late 2016. Uh, and I, I had been invited, it was a last minute event. I was invited to go to, um, oh, um, Reno and, <laughs> And uh, on the plane, I sat next to a lovely gentleman who's very friendly and we started talking and then it turns out that he was from this area in LA called Gardena and I had lived in like right next door in Torrance when I was in graduate school and so I knew Gardena quite well. I used to go there. There's a lot of really great Japanese restaurants and and I said, oh yeah, I know Gardena and um, he said, um, he said, oh, it has changed a lot. And it's true, Gardena has changed, like demographically. It used to be mostly Japanese, but now I think it's like, it kind of became more Korean over the last maybe 10 years. And he's like, oh, it's changed. You know, we have all those Koreans now. And then he said, the problem is they don't assimilate. And I was just, I was sorry I even asked, first of all, because you're in a, in a, in a in a um, plane and you're like, now I have to sit next to this guy until we arrive and this is gonna be unpleasant. Um, and so I asked him, you know, I think out of curiosity, maybe a bit of morbid curiosity, but not even morbid. I think I really was just trying to understand why he said something like that. Cause I, I actually know a number of Korean people, I have Korean friends and my husband's best friend is Korean. I've had uh, Korean colleagues, can, you know, I just didn't understand why he would say such a thing. And he said, well, I think he was complaining about how there's like, um, they send their kids to Sunday school where they learn their language. And I was just, you know, surprised that that's something, that bothered him, that had nothing to do with him, that didn't impede, it didn't mean that his kids couldn't go to whatever school he wanted to send them to. He was bothered that in their own free time, they were learning the language of their ancestors. And he took this to mean that somehow they had not embraced America enough. Now the United States does not have an official language 
Uh, and so what he is saying is that um, his language, which is English, uh, ought to be the dominant language that people embrace and they should give up their native languages in favor of it. That's what it really means. And to that sort of view of assimilation is, I'm sorry to say, on the ascendant. That is the kind of view that is now becoming more popular where people are like, look on with suspicion if people don't, you know, speak, if people speak foreign languages. Uh, and and so in the chapter, I basically look at the history of that uh, in the U.S. and how assimilation has been used both to police citizenship and who got to have access to it. Um, because at one point it was um, a condition of citizenship in the sense that people who did not have access to this citizenship by law, people who were on the periphery of whiteness had to file citizenship applications and then get to go before the judge. And let's say, for example, if you were a native person and you showed up in native dress and you had like your hair in native styles and you spoke in your own indigenous language, chances of getting that citizenship were pretty slim. And um, so, so I, in the chapter, I basically look at the history of assimilation and, and um, how it's been deployed over the, the years. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, it's um, the term assimilation is just used as, is, is, is like a tool or a weapon in a sense to be able to, mm -hmm. to drive into and othering mm -hmm. other, uh, other folks. Because, because when you say assimilation or they don't assimilate, like it basically means that you have the right to decide who is assimilated and who's not, right? And right. He clearly in that equation, he viewed himself as the person who has the authority to decide who's assimilating and who's not. And it doesn't occur to him that they might have a judgment about whether he's assimilated. No, for him, it's a one-way equation and he gets right. to decide whether they're assimilated. And which which really again brings us to the, to the, to the, the issue of power, right? Exactly. Power, yeah. Exactly. Power That's decade. exactly. And assimilation is always about power. It's not about, oh, they came, we came here first and they have to assimilate to us. That certainly wasn't the case when the, with, with indigenous people who were here first. And when the settlers came, they weren't <laughs> assimilating to indigenous people. They created this whole other system in which indigenous people were forcibly assimilated through the Indian boarding school system. So it really is about power. And um, um, in, in that chapter, I also talk about how when I was growing up in Morocco, I had, right. a, yes. <laughs> I had a number of French teachers and they basically were there because of a particular cooperation agreement that had been signed between Morocco and France following independence, where Morocco needed to hire a number of teachers all at once because it was opening a lot of schools. And so they hired a bunch of French teachers, not just to teach French, but to teach other subjects. So for example, I had um, uh, French teachers in math or I had them in physics. So it, it did happen and, and none of them spoke Arabic, not one of them. And so if, if my parents ever wanted to know how I was doing in calculus or how I was doing in French class or, or biology class, like they had to come and speak in French to the, to the teacher. And, you know, my parents are bilingual, so it was fine. But for other parents who were not, that put them already at a at a, a disadvantage. And nobody complained. Nobody said, wait a minute, these people are uh, foreign workers in our country, uh, immigrants, although nobody thought of them as immigrants, they thought of them as expats. And nobody complained that they didn't speak the language or dress like us or act like us or wear their hair like us. Uh, because uh, the because of the fact that they came from the former colonizing power and that imbued them with a certain amount of power themselves and so they were not questioned about that so assimilation often has to do with power the more the more powerful group sets the rules for how the less powerful group is going to be allowed in or out and certain behaviors that may seem okay one day could be taken away the next like could be could basically be decided to be unassimilated the next it really is a way to police the boundaries of citizenship no and and, and i related to that aspect of it because when i first came to to minnesota like you know i I didn't know the language at all either. So um, having to work with the, the current, uh, at that time, I think it was called ESL, having to have someone in the ESL program at the elementary school that I went to actually 
was from Brazil um, um, and spoke Portuguese. And so there was that um, correlation of like, we could somewhat understand each other was life-changing for me in a sense, because here I am a fourth grader coming into a whole different environment, cultural uh, shock in a sense, and not having anyone that I can even have a relate to in that sense uh, was, was, was that. So, so yeah, no, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of, and I, I, like I said, like I took notes in every, 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 every chapter of this book. It's, it's extremely, I, I really enjoyed it and I, and I related it to it a lot and I was able to not only um, see my own personal events, but see it from a different perspective, which was, which was great for me because I ended up learning more and, and, um, um, and specifically in the aspect of like, you know, um, when you talked about, um, you know, when you, when you were trying to sell one of your, uh, uh, there was a, the sofa uh, and you were talking to someone in Spanish, right? And these little events in life. And when you have all these microaggressions just come, come at you, like a lot of it just fills with that. And specifically for me, um, you know, as another writer, uh, a writer of color trying to be able to, you know, uh, not only talk about this but you know write about it it's 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 it, this this is a good um um uh, way of seeing how how to how to talk about that and how to be michael so i really appreciate um in your book and, and your words as well as your talent um i like i said i can dive in and go in a much more here but um is there is there anything else perhaps you want to cover before we decide to go into questions um no i mean i'm happy to answer any questions okay i think i'll, I'll i will move into those questions then um, um and let's um let's go ahead and then see some of these questions that we have over here um and i think i i took one on earlier um Oh, I think we're being told that we have time for just one more question. Oh, one more question. Oh, I must have misread that. I just get so caught up into such a great discussion. <laughs> Thank you for, for being it. Um, so here is this. Uh, your book focuses on events, real and imagined, in our corner of the world. I think all, especially the Moore's account, must have transnational appeal. Are your books available in other countries and languages? Do you know how your books have been received in Morocco in, in particular? Yeah, uh, so this one just came out 10 days ago. So rights have not been sold um, outside the US, nor would I expect it because it's a very sort of specific to US citizenship. But the other Americans, which just came out in paperback, this one is the most recent one. Yes, it has been translated into, I believe we're maybe at like 10 languages. And yes, it does include being published in Morocco. What we're doing for the Moroccan edition, we're doing this thing where we're doing a co-edition. So it's published in French, but it's also published in Morocco in a separate edition so that it's a little bit uh, more accessible uh, that's, that's amazing. financially. Yeah. Because you know, books can be expensive. And so- Right, right printed in Morocco, it's a lot cheaper than if they're imported uh, from France. Um, so they are um, generally really quite well received. And whenever there's a new book, I get a whole bunch of interviews, interview requests from Morocco. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that almost at every event I do in the US, people ask me how Moroccan audiences react to my book. But when I do events in Morocco, people ask me how American audiences react to my book. And I have always found that to be, you know, very moving because it tells me that book people are really curious about one another across, uh, you know, across the ocean, across, across the borders, ocean, the audiences, yeah. across borders. And I find that to be just, I don't know, I find it moving. It tells me that as long as we're curious about one another and we want to know more about one another, that that's on the whole a very positive mm. thing. So it always, it always delights me to get this question. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that is technically all the time we have for this evening. Um, thanks again, Lila, for posting us into your busy fall. And I appreciate the, the wonderful discussion. And I apologize if I dove way too much into the conversation, but I, I really, I really enjoyed this book and I'm, I'm happy that, um, and I wish you the best in, uh, 
and further in this book as well. Um, just wanted to say that this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of Melsta made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Uh, before you all log off, uh, look for the Club Book survey link, please, right? Uh, which is in the comments section uh, and it will be projected in place uh, in video momentarily. So please fill out the survey. Um, these books are, are available at your local bookstore. Mushali, the Red Balloon. Thank you for the Red Balloon. Um, last, consider joining Club Book on Tuesday, October 20th for a talk with National Book Award finalist David Troyer. Uh, they will be right here in Facebook Live. This is uh, this will all be co hosted by the Dakota County Library. And as always, it's free. So thank you once again. Thank you, Laila. Thank you, uh, everyone else who was able to make this possible. And um, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.